Today's discussion will be presented in five sections, since we are recording the session for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Feel free to post questions and comments during the session, and we'll try to get them answered online. We are particularly pleased to welcome our moderator, Tom Temin, the host of Federal Drive on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Let me turn over the reins to Tom to begin today's discussion. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Our guests today are Aaron Miller. He's the Chief of the Services Division of the CompSatCom Center at the Defense Information Systems Agency. And Ben Camerlin is the SATCOM Program Manager at the General Services Administration. And today our topic, of course, is satellite communications and how the government buys it and what some of the challenges are for it. But before we get into some of the details, uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Aaron. Give us a sense of the scope the demand levels and the types of services in general you're seeing from DOD customers that go through the DISA contracts? Oh, no problem. Well, we've seen a, a steady growth in our demand for commercial side communications going back to around 2001, 2002 with the beginning of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We saw that increase from about 2 gigahertz to a high water mark of 10 gigahertz around 2011. And since then, we have seen requirements tail off some and start to come down a bit, but we're still leasing in the neighborhood of around eight gigahertz worth of commercial bandwidth to augment our military SATCOM capability. All right, so gigahertz is, uh, that's, that's the main way you express the amount of capacity that you have in a satellite? Yes, sir. All right, and uh, at GSA, of course, you have the government-wide view, and I guess DISA uses, uh, Ben, your, your contracts, but what, what are you seeing in terms of demand patterns and what are people doing with it, as far as you can tell? Sure. So as you mentioned, um, thanks for having me, Tom, that GSA has the government-wide contracts. Currently, our um, acquisition strategy is called the Future ComSatCom Services Acquisition. And that was established in 2009 with a partnership between DISA and GSA to establish a common marketplace for all of the um, federal government to buy their ComSatCom services. So the DOD, as you could expect, is roughly accounts for about 90% of our bandwidth purchases on um, FCSA. And so generally what Aaron's seeing at DISA is following suit with what we see at um, GSA. And so with the civilian agencies that use 10% of this, do you have any sense of why they're doing it? Well, it, it ranges for multiple different regions, or reasons from um, disaster response to government training and video broadcast networks for, I mean, we have contracts with the Veterans Administration as well as Social Security Administration and then also um, primarily DHS. Okay, so um, I guess then the question becomes what are, what do you feel are smart strategies for planning SATCOM purchases and uh, because it, it's not, it's not a cheap commodity, you know, like other services might be and so what, what are some of the good strategies you see by which agencies are kind of deciding on how they go about this? Well, this is a problem that we have to get our hands around. Um, you know, with the advent of the war and the use of overseas contingency operations dollars, uh, the planning was for more in support of the war, and ComSatCom was needed to support that. So there was not really an appetite suppression. The money was available, and the services were bought. It wasn't bought in a, you know, a consolidated fashion. There's not a single program office for the DOD um, to purchase bandwidth. It's purchased by the users. They have a requirement they have the money so they buy it so what we really have to do is start looking at it holistically as a department and figure out what our total requirement is what our endurance requirement is and where we have opportunities for smart investments moving forward All right. so should is this something that everyone should always have a little bit of available no matter what well it depends on the mission uh, as you know the warfighter needs comsatcom to support things such as airborne ISR operations or video broadcast or tactical reach back to support the tactical warfighter. So in some cases you need a, to have a reserve capability, but we would hope that capability would be our MILSATCOM capability. And in other instances when we have a defined well-known requirement uh, that maybe that mission doesn't suit MILSATCOM, then we have to purchase COMSATCOM smartly. So while the warfighter, all, all aspects of the warfighter doesn't need it, no, a, lot do, a lot does, and those aspects that do need it have to plan for it smartly. So the MILCOM, the, the military or the government owned or government provisioned satellites, those can provide the baseline, but really the ramp up that you mentioned after 2001 and leading up to the peak, you know, say in around 2009, that was mostly commercial? Well, at the time of the war effort, our follow on satellite constellation, the WAGMAM Global SATCOM program, was not in existence as of yet. Those first satellites launched around 2007. Four satellites. 
Oh, there's yeah. six cold total on orbit today, but the mm -hmm. expectation is for 10. So at the time we went to war, those satellites were still in the planning phases. They weren't yet launched. So we had to go to war with commercial. And we purchased a lot of KU terminals, we purchased a lot of VSATs, and we used commercial because it was available, and we had to fight the war. Um, now that we have WGS, six WS satellites on orbit, uh, our, our goal is to maximum leverage those capabilities and then use commercial as an augmentation to that program. So moving forward, many of our programs that don't have military X and military K capabilities are going to be transitioning to those capabilities. And, and also we're using a lot of tri-band terminals. So we can use both commercial and military SATCOM. Okay, yeah, so in GSA, then you're, you're totally in the commercial space. Uh, so w when, when these MILSAT birds come online, there'll still be the demand for the commercial services for the rest of government? We don't foresee a total you know, lack of demand for commercial anytime in the near future for either um, the DOD or the rest of the federal government. And you know, similar to as Aaron man mentioned, it is, um, it is about getting your handle around the requirement and understanding what it is you're buying it and what it's used for and to structure our contracts in a way that is flexible enough so that agencies can purchase the COMSATCOM in the most efficient and economical manner possible for the type of service that they need. But is it <clears throat> wise for them to take kind of a spot spot market approach or is it something they should look at more strategically? You know, it, it really depends. It's, it's very difficult to say just based off of the type of mission and also there's a lot of new technologies coming on the market right now such as high throughput and high capacity satellites where the, um, the current estimates is basically 10 times or more the capacity on a single satellite that we currently have in orbit. So for some of those satellites or some of those missions you could go from a traditional transponder lease type of FSS satellite to a high throughput satellite and achieve tremendous efficiencies by using that technology. Okay, well we'll have to get into deeper a little bit into the technologies as we go forward, but I'm curious as to how much DISA and GSA interact day to day on this whole effort. We, um, we interact almost daily between the GSA program office, the DISA program office, and the GSA contracting officers. So we do have a very strong partnership that we continue to leverage and we're very proud of it and, and we want to continue to see that partnership grow and, be, and strengthen. Yeah, and I echo Ben's sentiments. I mean, we work together, uh, if not daily, every other day. Uh, I try to work with Ben as much as possible. No. All right. <laughs> and uh, just to, you know, ballpark figures, what do you think the government spends on, you know, on, uh, on uh, commercial satellite services annually? Is this a, you know, 100 million, billion, 10 billion? What's the order of magnitude it's, here? It's approximately a billion dollars a year. Uh, about 80% of that, 75 to 80% of that is on fixed satellite services and about 30% is on mobile satellite services. But it's a, collectively been around a billion dollars. And Ben, are the same people that are buying the standard ground-based communications and datacom people, the same people in the federal government that are also looking at satellite communications? In a lot of cases, not necessarily. There is um, a different a different user set for the satellite communications community than there is for the, uh, for the ground-based infrastructure. So it's a specialty. It, it really is, yes. SATCOM is a very special niche market. Because I've heard about 50 of the phrases you guys have thrown out on orbits and types of bandwidth and technology, so it sounds like you really have to have a specialized set of knowledge in order to intelligently go after this, this uh, type of acquisition. Yes, I would agree with that statement. And we also have to look more into the business sides of it uh, and not just understand our requirements, but understand the marketplace and the market trends so we don't make bad investments. Uh, and to echo on to Ben's answer that he gave on the previous question, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do in the DOD is make sure our terminal programs are aligned with our SATCOM purchasing programs so that we are not forcing ourselves to a one solution or another. So if you purchase a terminal that only works, uh, you know, that only works in commercial space, then you're going to buy commercial space. But if you buy a tri-band terminal, a terminal that works in both government or commercial space, you have more additional flexibility. So we have to make sure the programs are aligned so we're not driving the preconceived solutions. Uh, that had, like I said, it's a billion dollars worth of spending, so it has huge implications. All right, we're going to get into that a little bit more, but right now we'll take a short break. Our guests today are Ben Camerlin, the SATCOM Program Manager at the General Services Administration, and Aaron Miller, the Chief of the Services Division for Com SATCOM Center at the Defense Information Systems Agency. And this is Trends in Satellite Acquisition, Augmenting Government SATCOM. And I'm your moderator, Tom Temin, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com.